Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest. This week, professor and author Anais More on Oceania's nuclear and climate storytelling. The Pacific is still often put in the margins. There's a lot of focus on the mythical red buttons on desks in Washington and Moscow, and very little attention given to the material places at the margins of these Western mental maps in which the detonations actually happen. The extent of those detonations is comparable to the explosion of the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima every day for half a century. That's an apocalypse. There's no other way to describe this level of destruction. Literature is not always about teaching lessons, but they're often about trying to imagine a different future. These artists and everyone I know in Tahiti who's committed about these issues often says, we know what has been lost and we must now ensure that it will not happen again. Anais, welcome to Chatter. Thank you. It's so nice to talk to you. I'm very excited to talk to you because I've, I've read an amazing book that's outside of my comfort zone. It's not something that's in my normal area because I was a national security political science nerd, not a literature person. I didn't even take a standard literature class in college except for an independent study on Middle East literature that I did as part of a uh, uh, Middle East studies minor that I was creating as a patchwork quilt. So number one, you you obviously study literature and have done an analysis of it. And secondly, it's a, a very difficult topic for people to come in and uh, the feelings that come up are very strong. So I want to thank you for joining me because I think more people need to hear this. And this is one of those episodes where I'm evangelizing and telling people they need to become familiar with your work. But let me let me start by asking you, before we talk about so many other people's stories that you have talked about, to, to tell a bit of your own story, where you were born, where you grew up, um, and when you became aware of the oceanic experience with nuclear detonations. Thank you so much. I, I love this way of starting our discussion by talking about genealogies. Uh, my family is a pure product of French imperialism. My mother is a white woman born and raised in Senegal, and my adoptive father is a white man born and raised in Morocco. On my biological father's side, uh, his family were settlers in French-occupied Algeria. And I grew up mostly in the country officially known as French Polynesia, but uh, the country's indigenous name is Mo'ohinui. Uh, I grew up in the main island of Tahiti, which is the biggest of the 118 islands in the country. And my family moved there right after the end of French nuclear tests uh, in the late 90s. Growing up in a nuclear colony is a very unique experience, especially when you're part of the nuclear colonizers. It's the most taboo subject in family circles, in school settings, amongst friends, because talking about nuclear colonialism puts you and your close one firmly on the wrong side of history. Mm -hmm. So it very much wasn't talked about in my circles, but mm -hmm. it was a taboo on a national scale. I'd, I'd like to explore that just a bit because that's interesting. Not everyone uh, of your background on Tahiti and other islands were involved in the nuclear explosions, even though many, many people were because of the uh, the colonial and then military infrastructure around them. But but even then, you felt association with them simply because of your heritage. And it's a very complicated uh, boundary to make between what is part of the nuclear economy and what isn't. Because after the beginning of nuclear tests, up to 80% of the GDP was dependent directly on either nuclear spending or state spending that was presented unofficially as the nuclear debt. France was spending a lot of money, giving a lot of money to Ma'ohinui in an unofficial exchange for the nuclear se testing center since the very beginning. And that money was very poorly distributed. Uh, some people benefited hugely from uh, these 
economic opportunities and other people lost everything. They lost access to the land, they lost access to, uh, they, they didn't transmit transgenerational knowledge, they lost access to healthy food and had to depend on imported food. So the country, Mohinui is one of the richest countries in the Pacific, but that wealth is extremely, extremely unevenly distributed. Right. And the even those who benefit, if you will, from the wealth uh, have have that psychological burden of, of knowing the origins of it. And, and health and, burden, because cancer well, does course. not discriminate. That, that's that's yeah. exactly right. I'm betting that that most of our listeners know that France and, and the U.S. and the United Kingdom detonated nuclear weapons uh, across the Pacific uh, and Australia for decades. But I'm even more confident that they don't know the true scope and scale of it. Can you, can you describe the the sheer magnitude and the long duration of the nuclear experience across Oceania? Absolutely. And that's not a coincidence. Oceania, in most maps, is split in two and put in the margins of the world. And most islands are not even represented on the map. So it's really much out of Western consciousness most of the time. And even when it comes to talking about nuclear testing, which really shouldn't be called nuclear testing, it sh- as uh, Maori activist Hina Moyura Cross says, it should be called nuclear detonations for experimental purposes because these bombs very much were detonated. Um, Even when we talk about nuclear testing, the Pacific is still often put in the margins. There's a lot of focus on the mythical red buttons on desks in Washington and Moscow, and very little attention given to the material places at the margins of these Western mental maps in which the detonations actually happened. And a lot of the discourse around nuclear tests centers around the number of tests. But when you look at the yield of the tests, you have a completely different map. The overwhelming majority of thermonuclear weapons have been detonated in the Pacific Islands by all Western nuclear powers, the United States, the UK, and France. It was very much what um, geographer Firth called a nuclear playground. That was outside of the maps, outside of the mainstream media focus and remains to this day. You've you've pointed to a fact that I think is so easily overlooked that the the very language we use can minimize or or otherize or separate us from some of these things. And this is not unique to nuclear detonations, right? This is in so many areas of life. But in terms of this, I've I've just come to the realization that I've heard the phrase nuclear test my whole life. Uh, And it sounds very clean. It sounds very academic. It sounds very much like a a safe laboratory setting to call it a test. Mm. But it's it's not a test. Uh, Now there is, you know, much computer simulation of nuclear detonations. But back when they were physical tests, um, these were actual nuclear explosions to the point that the United States, France, and the United Kingdom collectively detonated a blast equivalent to not just Hiroshima, uh, not just hundreds of times more than Hiroshima, but dozens of thousands of times more powerful than Hiroshima um, in the skies and uh, under the water in the Pacific. Tests doesn't convey that. (laughs) It almost makes it seem antiseptic. And using detonations at least gets across the the, the sense of what happened more. Um, and there could be other terms we associate with it, but I'll try to use detonations from this point forward to to help convey that that this is not something that happened in a in a you know controlled classroom. <laughs> this is something that actually uh, devastated and in some cases literally destroyed places on this planet. Absolutely. The vocabulary around nuclear detonation and nuclear colonialism is very much fraught. Um, Mm -hmm. The extent of those detonations is comparable to the explosion of the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima every day for half a century. 
that's an apocalypse. There's no other way to describe this level of destruction. It has to be reminded over and over again that this is a type of destruction that did not exist on our planet. The only other closest place this force of destruction exists is in our sun. There's a very concrete difference between nuclear weapons and conventional weapons that, again, is not conveyed by the vocabulary, saying an unconventional weapon or even saying a bomb. It's right. it's a right. form of violence dozens of thousands of times more powerful than any bomb, even the mother of all bombs that was dropped on Afghanistan to much mm -hmm. international outrage in uh, 2017 by former President Donald Trump is 0.0001% uh, uh, the power of some of those nuclear bombs. Right. And, and you've written about some of this. Uh, Annie Jacobson has recently uh, written a, a major book about this. The accounts of what an actual nuclear explosion is like, um, you know, birds from dozens, if not hundreds of miles away, blinded and, and crashing into things, uh, and then what it does to living cells, human and otherwise. It is a, a strong distinction from even the very strong, what we would call conventional weapons. The The experience that that you've written about, you, you are, a, you know, studying and teaching French and comparative literature. And the way you've looked at this most is through what you call Pacific post-apocalyptic literature. And so much of it, not all, but so much of it is, is people of the region dealing with the legacy consequences, the reality of living in a nuclear environment, uh, and then applying that in a couple of interesting ways. You note that this literature does not feature simplistic messages calling on individuals to simply go green, that it's more about resilience, it's about life cycle. And that is immediately relevant now, even as we hope nuclear detonations in Oceania are finished forever. Uh, but it's relevant because we have a climate crisis mm -hmm. and we can actually learn from the experiences of dealing with these, these apocalyptic issues here. So I'd like to, to dig into that a little bit using your term of stories to capture all of the varied forms of expression from, from print to oral, from digital to disembodied. It really began in the late 1950s and 1960s, if I understand right. Um, but most of it was invisible and remains invisible or inaudible to wider audiences. Certainly in the United States, I've never come across any of these literature uh, examples or art forms that you write about. And I'm wondering if you can describe that, the, the emergence of these forms of expression within the country you grew up in and elsewhere, and why it is that these simply haven't been communicated out very widely yet. Yes. Thank you for emphasizing the importance of storytelling. I think it's it's important to not only tell the history of political resistance to nuclear colonialism, but also look at the artistic, the creative forms of resistance, because it gives a different perspective and a different chronology. The political organizing against these repeated imperial assaults started in the 50s and really coalesced strongly and internationally in the, in the 70s with the Nuclear Free and Independent Pacific Movement. But the first anti-nuclear songs were sang in 1945. And that's a perspective that can only be apprehended by recognizing the value and the power of stories. Because wow. it's on one hand, it's harder to become a politician or a historian. It takes a lot of mm -hmm. uh, training and it takes a lot of necessary interaction with the nuclear colonizer. Uh, whereas the singers that started denouncing nuclear weapons, that started comparing them with a demon mm -hmm. in 1945, uh, for example, there was a group of religious singers in Uveamo Futuna, the, the French colony also known as Wallace and Futuna, uh, who gathered to talk about Hiroshima, to relay the news about what happened in Hiroshima and immediately placed nuclear weapons on the side of evil. Few of our listeners, I'm sure, in the United States will remember that uh, Uvea 
was occupied by the U.S. military for several years, and Uveans were were recruited to do forced labor, were recruited to participate in World War II, and their island was devastated by the American military presence, which informs this skepticism about that bomb that was presented as the bomb who would, which would end all wars in mm-hmm. 1945. And it seems from even that, that early time that there was a, a visceral understanding of the, the horror that this would do to the environment, that is, you know, to the life of the sea, to the life uh, in the air and on the land, that it wasn't something that was done by observation across, you know, studies of decades, it was an immediate recognition of, even though it's a faraway thing at the time, it became much closer, but even though it was a faraway thing, um, this, this changes our, our balance with life on earth. Absolutely. And this challenge is really the nuclear military claim that the tests were confined atmospheric tests were confined, the fallout could be predicted, underground tests were confined, the radioactivity was supposed to be trapped in the basaltic rock of these atolls. Mm -hmm. These stories represent nuclear explosions as apocalypses that affect everything and everyone. For example, the anti-nuclear novel by Witi Ihimaira, a Maori writer, represents the French nuclear testing in the atoll of Moruroa by describing it as a celestial explosion. When the French for decades, and to this day, continue to claim that the tests were confined to this specific uh, contained environment, which was supposed to remain trapped within the atoll. So the, there's a slogan in the Pacific anti-nuclear movement that was coined by Teresa Teaiwa, an Ikiriba scholar, who says what happens in one part of the Pacific affects us all. And that was recognized as early as in 1945. Wow. That is amazing. I want to highlight uh, and perhaps just introduce and explore some of these many artists that you highlight in your new book, The Ocean on Fire, Pacific Stories from Nuclear Survivors and Climate Activists. Um, Let's start with and I'm going to get some of these names right, and I'm going to get most of them wrong, but I, I hopefully you can interpret the pronunciation well enough to, to tell us uh, who these people really are and represent them better. But let's start with Paul Tavo from Vanuatu and his 2015 novel uh, translated into English as When the Cannibal Sneers. Uh, can you describe that work and, and why you chose to highlight its themes? That's a fascinating work that's... Uh unfortunately, was not translated into English or hasn't been translated into English yet. So that's your translation of the title, yeah? (laughs) Yeah. From Vanuatu, one of the most fascinating countries when it comes to anti-colonial resistance. Vanuatu was described as the Cuba of the Pacific for its strong anti-nuclear stance against both French and British nuclear colonizers. It was the only country that was jointly colonized by the French and the British uh, in what became known as the Franco-British uh, condominium, uh, which was rapidly nicknamed the Pendominium because everything was duplicated. There were wow. Two medical systems, two mm-hmm. police systems, two everything. So um, <laughs> since the French and the British couldn't agree on who would colonize Vanuatu, they created this huge mess. And Vanuatu is, like most specific countries, an archipelago that has underwent three apocalypses. The first was the epidemiological apocalypse with the imported viruses that decimated, the numbers are debated, but whether it's 70% or 90% of the population, it is unimaginable in terms of the violence of these imported viruses. Then consequences from fallout from American, British, and French nuclear tests, and now climate change. The form of, I don't want to use the word resilience because it's so connoting passivity, but the, 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 the strength that comes from having underwent three apocalypses is what animates this novel by Paul Tavo. 
he describes specific uh, literature as oceanitude. He is inspired by the philosophy developed in the Atlantic, the negritude movement, uh, and he wonders what would constitute a basis for Pacific philosophies, what unites all of those diverse islands, and he calls it the philosophy of oceanitude in English. Uh, the realization that we are nothing without the places that sustain us, we are nothing without our ocean, and what affects the environment affects everyone. What you've uh, described about his work is is characteristic of so many artists uh, in in the region uh, more widely, which is artists who aren't in 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 the U.S. We use the phrase "playing the victim card," right? Where it's you know bad things have happened to me, and I'm going to tell you about them. Um, and there is a purpose to sharing experiences that others don't know about to let them know about horrors that have happened. But that doesn't seem to be the purpose of almost any of the art that you're describing. It's, it's, it's to basically talk about that strength. That I, I don't know a better word than resilience, but the, the endurance, the mm -hmm. the fortitude, the the actual growth that comes from some of these experiences. So, it seems like there are a lot of descriptions of these apocalyptic issues, no doubt. But the purpose is different. It's it's not to point the finger at oneself and say, therefore, you need to feel sorry for me. It it almost sounds, in many cases, like so many of these works we'll talk about are almost triumphalist in many ways. That's, that's a very interesting way of putting it. Many of these writers have shared having written these stories or sang these stories or danced these stories for their children or for their community mm -hmm. and almost being uh, surprised sometimes when they found themselves published and uh, put in the, in the uh, forget the expression in English, but in, in the light uh, center stage for the success of their stories. These are not written for the colonizers for the most part. And this is evidenced in um, not only in their testimonies of why they wrote those stories, but uh, the, the putting the apocalypse in historical perspective. Yeah. There's one, and I'm just going to go through several people here that struck me reading about uh, their experiences and their work. Uh, from from your descriptions, and again, hopefully you'll figure out who they are through the mispronunciations. But there was a Tahitian-born artist, Rai Chaz, yes. with the short story Eden that was very striking. And I'm wondering if you could talk about her personal story and a little bit about Eden. Rai Chaz comes from the Tuamotu Archipelago, <laughs> the archipelago in which French France tested its uh, most dangerous thermonuclear weapons. And she grew up in Tahiti. So she witnessed both the environmental destruction closest to the nuclear testing sites in the Tuamotu Archipelago and the socio-economic, the socio-political upheaval that followed the creation of the nuclear testing center. Uh, in her short story, Eden, she discusses a central problem in Pacific societies that is very little discussed in, for example, in state archives and military archives. Mm -hmm. And that is the contamination of fish in nuclear colonies. Not only the nuclear contamination, but also the Ciguatera contamination. Ciguatera is a disease that mm -hmm. is prevalent around nuclear testing sites, but that is not linked to radiation. It's linked to coral destruction. And she politicizes this issue. She shows what it's like to have a community's relationship with marine life, with animals, suddenly shattered when the species that were the source of your life and mm -hmm. so central to your culture become poisonous overnight. She plays very interestingly with the biblical imagery to describe this paradise that becomes contaminated where eating the fish eating the forbidden fish has the same consequences as eating the forbidden fruit in the garden of eden and she describes the, the main character in her novel dies of ciguatera and his death becomes his salvation being expelled from eden becomes his salvation because the paradise has been so contaminated that he mm -hmm. welcomes his own demise 
Right. Uh, this short story bears important consequences, not only in nuclear colonies, but in the era of mass extinction. It asks us, it asks everyone, Pacific stories have universal knowledge because it asks everyone to think of what relationships with other than humans can look mm -hmm. like. And she's not advocating for creating nature preserves or uh, putting a keep out sign uh, in non-human environments. She's advocating for recreating a communal, mutually beneficial relationship with uh, what is very appropriately called the natural environment. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read just a brief excerpt here from the the final scene, which is uh, intense and, as you note, almost hallucinatory here. And it has a focus on the, the red bird, the Manu Ura, that has overseen the death of the fisherman you just described. And it uh, goes like this. Manu Ura, suspend your flight. Your rock necklace is too heavy. It melts in the sun, in the fire. It sinks. Melt your stones under the sun. Suspend your flight and think. Joy leaves pirouetting. Insanity is here. There's a lot packed into there. There's a lot one can interpret from this, from the, the rock necklace to the melting. Uh, and of course, just the closing line that insanity is here. It's probably uh, more beautiful in the original French, but I'm not going to destroy the language by trying to pronounce it uh, as much as I do in English. But I'm wondering how you interpret this, uh, this stunning ending and how you think it really captures the core ideas that Chase is trying to express. Yes, this ending is very poetic and open to many interpretations, uh, but I think her insistence on the flower necklace, she perverts it here by making it uh, a stone necklace, showing the weight of nuclear colonialism, because flower necklaces symbolize the much-marketed hospitality of Pacific islands. And here it's right. showing what this welcoming has become you couldn't say the tahiti welcomed the nuclear center because so many people opposed it but um at the end of the nuclear center was opened in tahiti and it, and it continues to weigh and will will continue to weigh for generations for hundreds of thousands of years uh, and the conclusion melts your stones under the sun can only be interpreted as a message to the nuclear colonizers why wasn't the bomb detonated in Paris if it's safe? Why is it, wasn't it detonated in France? To which French authorities answered, well, this is France. <laughs> so, uh, but she puts here in poetic form one of the central messages of the nuclear free and independent specific movement. If it's safe, test it in Paris, store it in Tokyo, and uh, dump it in Tokyo and store it in Washington, but keep our Pacific nuclear free. And the Feelings that I don't know if this was your experience, but I think when reading this novel, you have a very different feeling than in mainstream media about the way that the mass extinction and the environmental issues are usually described. Uh, mass media and big NGOs tend to try to appeal to the pity of its viewers, of its listeners, and re rely on the what, what is often called the information deficit model. If only people knew how bad it is, then they would act differently. This novel proceeds on, with a completely different premise. It does not try to trigger pity. Uh, it emphasizes the insanity of the situation. We've already lost 70% of wildlife. In nuclear colonies, all life has become irradiated. This is not something to feel pitiful about. This is insane. She, that's why she says insanity is here. And it's also interesting that she focuses, unlike you know the WWF, which features the panda or the polar bear or charismatic megafauna, she features here small fish and clam. Mm -hmm. Because, what, again, there's this specific philosophy, what happens to the most marginalized, what happens to the smallest forms of life affects us all. So it's very much a different way of thinking of the human other than human relationship. Yeah, it's a very different perspective. Uh, certainly in my life, my whole life, I've 
been bombarded, if you will, uh, with the images of the the polar bear going extinct, the you know the cute the cute animals, if you will, to try to draw that empathy for that. And and there is good intention, obviously, behind that, but it doesn't get to ecosystems, right? In that case, you're you're trying to save this this cute animal or this cute species for because you find it beautiful. You're not trying to sustain a wider relationship between all life on earth. And I think some of the stories you you describe very well get at that, that it isn't about any individual creature for our own use or benefit. It's about the entire system and our place in it. And I want to quote Potamatoe biologist Robin Wall Kimmerer, who says, Mm. we are deluged by information regarding our destruction of the world and hear almost nothing about how to nurture it. It is no surprise then that environmental become synonymous with dire predictions and powerless feelings. The participatory role of people in the well-being of the land has been lost or reciprocal relations reduced to a keep out sign. This is exactly what specific stories fight against. They're not advocating for keeping humans outside of an imagined, fantasized, static nature. They're chanting the strength and the regenerative power of these mutual relationships between indigenous communities and their lands that have been regenerative through multiple apocalypse. Absolutely. I'd like to shift to another uh, trailblazing work that that you spend a lot of time analyzing, and that's The Whale Rider. Um, a- amazing story and it's been made into a film which doesn't capture uh, some of the important elements of the original work. But talk about The Whale Rider and and its author and why it is uh, so seminal and why its themes uh, resonate so widely in the region. Again, The Whale Rider is a literary rendition of the political demands of the nuclear free and independent Pacific. It is the story of... A whale herd that deviates from its primordial route due to underwater nuclear tests in Moruroa and shores itself in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The story becomes the narrative of the fight of the Maori protagonists who try to save the whales from dying short on the beach. Um, So it shows the interconnectedness between Aotearoa, New Zealand, and Mo'ohinui, French-occupied Polynesia, which are thousands of miles apart, but used to be connected by transoceanic migration before those migrations were put to an abrupt end by colonialism. And it shows again what happens in the in one part of the Pacific affects us all. And uh, it's one of the very few, I want to say, hopeful stories in this book that uh, really has a happy ending. The protagonists manage to bring the whales back to the sea because a young girl has the gift to talk to the whales. Mm-hmm. And this reproduces the story of the whale rider, a story that was passed from generation to generation uh, of a leader who can talk to whales. Mm -hmm. So we see here a different conceptualization of time. The succession of apocalypses here is not uh, a decline narrative. Nor is it the usual progress narrative that we hear all the time in in Western mainstream discourse. It's a cyclical narrative. Hmm. The apocalypse repeats itself with a difference. And here the difference is that the protagonist is a woman, an indigenous woman leader, Mm -hmm. who challenges the sexism that was in place at the time uh, embodied in this book by her grandfather. So it's a form of 
it, this story embodies the power of indigenous women's leadership in facing, in adapting, in finding fortitude in the face of different uh, threats. And it is hopeful, as you mentioned, the ending is hopeful in that she is able to obviously get through that uh, institutional and, and societal sexism and save some of these whales. So it is hopeful in that sense. But as you just pointed out, with this very cyclical view of, you know, there have been and there will be apocalypses, right? This isn't a happy ending that all of it is over and we live happily ever after. It's it's a return to the cycle. So maybe it ends on a happy note, but the overall key is a minor key that is very sad of we are going to be repeating this in one form or another, and there will always be these obstacles to overcome. Absolutely. It again tackles the three main apocalypses that have taken place in the Pacific, the epidemiological mm -hmm. apocalypse, the nuclear apocalypse, and the climate apocalypse. And there's a very interesting parallel that's being made with Maori people, the indigenous mm -hmm. people of Aotearoa, New Zealand, which in the 19th century were described by most colonizers as doomed to disappear in contact with the so-called superior right, white race. Mm -hmm. um, and you see, obviously, today that Maori culture is not only still here, but vibrant and a, a leading force in the environmental movement. Yeah. Uh, what th this ability to survive an apocalypse demonstrated by the Maori people is revisited in a novel by showing the whale's ability to survive the nuclear apocalypse because so many whales die in the novel 200 whales die and yet it ends on this vision of maybe hope is too strong of a word but it, mm -hmm. it emphasizes the potential for regeneration with the few whales that survive and they return to the sea and that is an important message to focus on in the era of nuclear colonialism and of uh, carbon imperialism in, in our era of climate change because climate apathy is a momentous problem. Too many people feel like it's already too late. The, mm. the collapse is already going to happen. We have already put enough CO2 in the atmosphere to warm the planet by more degrees than you can mm. even conceive when you start thinking about the devastation to all forms of life. But what this novel suggests is that it is always worth to keep fighting for what is left. The few whales that survive were worth the fight. And this resonates very much today, which mm. every whale not dying is worth fighting for. Every decimal of a degree not warmed is worth fighting for. Uh, it is never too late to start mourning what has been lost and defend that which still remains. Absolutely. Well, either because of uh, where you grew up or despite where you grew up, I'm not sure, sure which, um, you understand that the immediate imagery that comes to mind for most people who have not been um, to, to your country or any of Oceania for that matter um, there, there's a few common themes that pop up when people think about the region. One is, you know, pristine cleanliness. Uh, that is, you know, the absolutely clean air and water, which of course is belied in so many areas by the nuclear detonations and their aftermath. And then the other one is the, you know, the welcoming, uh, available, eager, often Polynesians, but not exclusively Polynesians, um, who you know welcome you with the flower necklaces and often the imagery across the 1950s to make sure that French military officers wanted to come to the South Pacific of being the sexually available uh, local women. And you do a, a, a good job of analyzing some imagery that relates to this and how nuclear activists and others have basically co-opted this imagery in very clever ways. So with the acknowledgement that it is very difficult to talk about visuals uh, in an audio form, <laughs> which we're doing here, but can you describe how 
how artists have taken those those themes of paradise, uh, of cleanliness in the environment, and of the the welcoming women of the region, and turned those into some very vibrant and powerful images to highlight the the horrors of the nuclear experience. Yeah, it was quite a feat, right, to turn the most militarized region in the world into this fantasy of a semi-desert island except for sexually available women. So since Obama declared the Pacific pivot in 2011, the Pacific is the region of the world with the most military bases, the most military contingents, uh, the most geopolitical tensions to some extent. Uh, and yet the image of the tropical postcard island remains. So uh, Pacific artists have addressed this paradox in very humorous artworks. Uh, they play with the juxtaposition of nukes and nudes and how Western colonizers have focused on censoring nudity through Christianization and evangelization, mm -hmm. but not censoring nukes in the region. Yeah. So there's, for example, this artwork by Tahitian artist Kronos that features a famous Tahitian postcard of a classical Tahitian woman. She's wearing a sarong, she's bare-breasted, she has long black hair, she's pictured by the beach. And he puts this postcard in front of a nuclear cloud mm. and calls it French Apocalypse Now with a little red censored box on her breasts. And this reflects the history of French censorship in the region. It was for decades illegal to show your breasts. And shortly thereafter, it was perfectly legal to detonate weapons of mass destruction in the same region. Uh, I want to point out that this form of humor is inspired by a transgenerational tradition of humor that's called the Ari Oi humor hmm. in Tahiti that focuses on innuendo and sexual banter to poke fun at people in power. So again, you see this ability to draw from centuries-long, millennia-long traditions to reassert the vitality of your culture in the face of the nuclear apocalypse. And it's particularly important still to this day because the French military relied and continues to perpetuate the myth of a sexually available Tahitian woman. Most people, when you tell them Tahiti, they think of Gauguin and his bare-breasted uh, Tahitian woman. So the, you have these images, like Gauguin's paintings, that have silenced the Tahitian people and silenced the Tahitian women. It is urgent to turn to a different imagery when thinking about Tahiti and the Pacific in general, really. And it's so it's so fascinating that the humor, you know, I see the images that play on those, and clearly they're they're, they're humorous. It's a it's a dark humor. It's a um, a very biting humor. But the images definitely do do pick on that. But knowing that there is a centuries long tradition, maybe millennium long tradition um, of that kind of if you will, a court jester, that part of the societal norm was, yes, you would have people travel and use these uh, uh, almost aggressively sarcastic forms of humor in order to do political and social commentary. And, and these images pick up on that in a very modern way. Except it was way less dangerous to practice that form of traditional humor, to, try to practice Ari Oi humor in mm -hmm. the... 16th, 17th, 18th century than it was under nuclear colonialism. Um, mm. Artists such as André Marere or Bobby Olocom, respectively from Tahiti and Hawaii, did not sign their anti-nuclear works because they were censorship, and that's not at all conveyed enough in contemporary mm. discourse. It was so dangerous to be vocally anti-nuclear in those anti-nuclear colonies. The first anti-nuclear leader was falsely accused of arson charges put on trial and exiled in the late 1950s, Puvan Aopa. And after that, anti-nuclear activists faced intimidation, blackmail, permanent surveillance by secret services, uh, mm -hmm. attempts at corruption. Um, anyone who was not uh, a Mohi person was threatened with 
deportation, exile. It was, these are absolutely amazingly brave works of art. And that is hard to really put in context when we see them today floating on social media. It was, it was not at all uh, an innocuous form of political humor. Yeah. That's interesting because I knew that the, uh, and, and I, I know that there's not a clear distinction between these categories, that there's a significant overlap, but I knew that the activists, if you will, um, had that kind of surveillance and security activity. I had not been aware that the artists uh, felt that. Um, and perhaps it was, you know, correlated with their activism, but that the expression itself could be a trigger for some kind of repression from the authorities. Absolutely. Some of the artists that I discuss in this book, they haven't given me authorization to share their names, but they've been told explicitly by the secret services that they were being followed, that their phones were tapped for yeah. writing, you know, for writing anti-nuclear novels or short stories. Yeah. So this yeah. really speaks in the eyes of the French secret services, at least. Doing mm. anti-nuclear art, writing anti-nuclear literature was dangerous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to also address the issue of, of climate change and its effect on Oceania and on what artists there are telling us about it. Uh, one thing struck me in particular that you, that you wrote, and I'm going to read another excerpt here, and this is from a Samoan American spoken word performer. Um, I won't do it justice, but I'll give a sense of, of some of her words. What is it like to know that home is something that's waiting for you to return to it? What does it mean to belong to something that isn't sinking? What does it mean to belong to what is causing the flood? Haunting words for anybody like me and, and, and most of us listening to this who are in a, a very safe place and are not facing a true existential crisis within our lifetimes of literally the, the land that we and our ancestors have, uh, have, have lived on being gone, literally sinking, literally disappearing. Um, talk a little bit about these, these themes, the, the themes of loss, not of personal loss, but of this, the entire system of life loss and how artists are trying to address it. This is a thread that's presented in the mainstream climate discourse as a looming threat. And it is a looming threat, but it's important to put in perspective, in historical perspective, and remember that under nuclear colonialism, countless communities have seen and lived what it's like to see your house, your home, your land, become off limits for hundreds of thousands of years. That's right. And the forced dislocations that come from that. Absolutely. Yeah. So these, this is where literature can, and arts in general can assume yet another role. We've talked about mourning. We've talked about creating different types of emotion, of anger. Um, here, literature functions as a way to maintain a relationship with a lost home a lost land away from it. Um, I'm particularly interested in the works by Keithy Jethel Kijener from the Marshall Islands and Teresia Teaiwa from the nuclear colony of Kiribati, amongst other places, who manage in their poetry to make mourning rituals for the land that is now unlivable. And again, the temporal boundaries are very hard to separate because we're talking about nuclear colonialism, but we're also talking about climate change. Uh, and both issues are compounded. Uh, the nuclear arms race is one of the biggest producers of CO2 emissions. The military in general is one of the biggest producers of CO2 emission. And on the other hand, Rising sea levels and climate change in general is intensifying nuclear risks. A lot of these nuclear testing sites where plutonium has been quote unquote stored are low lying atolls and rising sea levels will increase the pollution that is already very bad. So uh, those problems are often siloed in contemporary discourse in, in, in the Western world. 
right. anti-nuclear activists don't often put the climate first and foremost in their discourse. Uh, climate activists don't often think about nuclear weapons, but the two are very much interconnected and are part of the same system and should be apprehended jointly, which is what both artists do when thinking about how both climate change and nuclear colonialism keeps them away from their homes. There's this poem by uh, Selena Neiro Grim, more than just a book passport, that says, my home with a sign that said, do not return for 25,000 years. It's been 70 years, she's referencing here the American nuclear tests in the Marshall Islands. And she continues, we have 24,930 years left. How far do you think she'll be underwater? Mm. Mm. Yeah, the explicit linkage there. Uh, and, and, and she's not the only one, as you pointed out. Many artists are, are making these connections in a way that to us, at least to me, I should say, seems clever and interesting, but it's obvious to the artists. It's it's not something that they see as a startling insight to provide the connective tissue because the connective tissue is is their life. It is their environment. I'd like to pick up the work of, and I'll get the name wrong again, Teresa Teaiwa, who's a, a scholar in Pacific Studies, anti-nuclear activist, but a popular poet and, and writer. Um, you noted that although she has written often and been quoted often on issues involving nuclear dislocation, that she she actually doesn't write about the nuclear tests in her own home country, uh, Kiribati. And I'm curious about that decision and, and what you make of it, because so much of artistic expression comes from that 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 personal lived experience. And, and in this case, it's, it's one of these oddities that, that stands out. Teresia Teaiwa has an intimate knowledge of what she refuses to call uh, displacement. She calls it dislocation uh, in both sides of her family. On her father's side, her father comes from the island of Banaba in, in Kiribati that was mined for phosphate mining and was exiled to Fiji. Uh, on her mother's side, her mother being African American, she carries the memory of slavery and that forced displacement. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. she calls it dislocation because she knows the trauma that comes with being brutally torn away from your land on both sides of her family. And I find it completely baffling that in her main essays and her main poetical pieces and her main songs on nuclear colonialism, she does not mention Kiribati. She does not mention the island of Tirapukatea and of Kiribati, where the British tested their most dangerous thermonuclear weapons. It seems to me that here her poetry and her songs are conveying that the islands are so lost that they don't even find their place in the poetry of one of the country's most national and loved poet and thinker. Yeah. So this is an interesting yeah. reminder of the limits of the healing power of literature and of the limits of mourning. Yeah, it's almost that the absence of it, it is an important expression in and of itself and, and making that, that wider point. I was struck by the... I don't know, the retaking of the coconut imagery. Because again, to outsiders from the region, the coconut kind of captures some of these themes, right? Whether it's it's used as a clothing device for someone who otherwise has no clothing, or whether it is a symbol of that carefree, perfect, untainted existence. Um, and yet the coconut has a very different imagery for especially Polynesian uh, people. And and I think it was her, but perhaps others who who use that that imagery to connect a lot of these issues of of dislocation and relating to the the nuclear and climate issues, right? Yes, it was her in her famed coconut series, where she explores the symbolism of that fruit and makes it both a symbol of forced displacement and a reminder of roots. She plays on the roots and roots uh, 
uh, pun here because the coconut tree and the coconut in general, with the tree, the tree is rooted, but you can make a canoe out of the tree trunk. And on the canoe that allows you to cross oceans, Polynesians brought coconuts to drink during the voyage and to replant in their new islands. So it's a symbol of both mobility and the ability to start anew and of rootedness of where you come from. So she uses that symbol in her, in her poetry, um, both when talking about nuclear colonialism and when talking about climate change. She made this song, uh, A Coconut a Day Will Kill You, if you live in Mururoa, if you live in Fangataufa, A Coconut a Day Will Kill You, uh, a parody of the yeah. famed American saying, an apple a day uh, right. is good right. for you. I don't know the... Uh, the American saying an, an apple, an apple. Well, the way I learned it as a kid, learned it. It wasn't something I studied. It was something that was just in the environment. It was an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Right. And that rhyme was supposed to tell you, you eat your fruits and you will be okay, <laughs> which that's... I'm not sure if it's medically sound, but <laughs> at least it wasn't, you know, eating the, the pizza and hamburgers keeps the doctor away. Well, in um, nuclear colonies, eating coconuts was banned in many right. islands. There were signs that said, don't eat coconuts. Uh, but the coconut, she also uses this powerful symbol in her poetry about climate change because coconuts don't sink. So it carries this symbol um, of endurance. Right, the ability to to ride out the waves but the issue is, you know, what if the fundamental nature of the water changes, right? The acidification of the oceans, the um, salinity changes, and coconuts coconuts may not be able to ride the waves when what they're riding on itself is fundamentally altered. Yes. In her poem entitled Fear of an Estuary, she identifies as a coconut needing fresh water. Uh, freshwater here can be read as a symbolism of melting ice caps. And she writes, if I were a coconut, I would sink, sink, sink when you met freshwater. But the wise ones say, I will not drown. This is another instance in which literature is a precursor to political movements, because you recognize in this poem the slogan of the Pacific Climate Warriors, now one of the main climate uh, organizations in the Pacific, we are not drowning, we are fighting. Yeah, to me, you know, looking at this whole range of storytellers that you highlight, and and I know there are many more that, that you can't highlight in, in your writing uh, that you, you certainly have experienced, but in the ones that you do, a theme definitely comes across of that Again, resilience doesn't quite capture it, but there's it's almost the Finnish uh, term of sisu, this this just persistence and fortitude and inner strength. And that is not universal in these works, but it is close to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a very common idea. And there have even been some artists, I think it was Chantel Spitz, um, who you also write about, who explicitly explores some of these binaries and and points out just how complicated these issues are and sometimes the only thing that can get you through is this this persistent uh belief maybe even in the cyclical nature of life and existence um but that's definitely a theme that comes across that is relevant uh literature isn't always about you know teaching lessons but there are lessons to be learned from these experiences and these stories for all of us during this time of change Literature is not always about teaching lessons, but uh, they're often about trying to imagine a different future. And these artists and everyone I know in Tahiti who's committed about these issues often says, we know what has been lost and we must now ensure that it will not happen again. Um, and I think I'm just going to use this opportunity to talk about the next massive problem that we have not touched upon yet is the fact that there remains 13,000 nuclear and thermonuclear weapons on this planet waiting right. to be detonated. Right. Um, so many of these artists and poets uh, are anti-nuclear activists, not only trying to mend the past 
to heal, to ask for reparations about past nuclear harms, but also trying to ban all nuclear weapons and ensure that the horrors of the nuclear apocalypse will never be unleashed again. Uh, none of the nuclear armed states have ratified the treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And that's uh, these, what many of these former nuclear colonies are pushing for is the assurance that their children, our children, can grow up in the world free of nuclear weapons. Right. And that I, I'm going to freelance here and guess that there is another lesson that, that can, in a sense, be learned here and perhaps some crucial assistance from the people of this region to help, which is that the difficulty with nuclear weapons and with any technology is you can ban its manufacture, right? You can ban its availability for use. You can't ban the knowledge that created it. Um, that is out there in the world, and you can have a 99.9% .9 effective ban on nuclear weapons, and yet you still could have even a group of dedicated individuals, because the knowledge is out there how to create this, who could still do it. And across Oceania, across so many years, the, the cultures have experienced diffusion of knowledge and things that have been dangerous to the, to the environment widely defined and discovered some ways of dealing with things that are harmful to the collective and to society. And I wonder if all of us need to learn lessons from all societies on ways of dealing with things that are, you know, a collective horror and yet are knowledge based and can't be banned. Uh, we cannot ban nuclear physics. Mm -hmm. um, we cannot ban the way that nuclear explosions can occur. We can ban the manufacture of them, but the, there's still going to be the possibility of the knowledge leading to manufacture. And we need ways as a society to deal with that problem, not just the ban itself. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And there is another form of knowledge that is important and that cannot be banned is the expertise of what it's like to live in nuclear fallout. This is what the artists, these poets are sharing. It's their expertise of life in the post-nuclear apocalypse. And they share it in really the most universal and gut-wrenching language possible. They share what it's like to see disease take your loved ones one after the other. They share what it's like to see the disease rot your body. They share what it's like to give birth to children who are so irradiated that they cannot survive more than a few hours is this form of very material knowledge that needs to be yeah. put yeah. in dialogue with the much more theoretical knowledge of, as you said, nuclear physics, but also nuclear strategy uh, when discussing nuclear deterrence um, and, and nuclear alliances and all that. It's, it's, it should never be done without turning to the expertise of these communities, these thinkers, these philosophers who have lived the nuclear war. One of the things that I struggle with thinking about some of these huge issues that are truly global issues, um, the tension between l lamenting and celebrating what has been lost or is being lost, but also having the, the energy to, to, to fight for, for what we have. And, and you close your book with a, a stunning capture of this, that that spoke to me because it, it got my thoughts in a way that I had not been able to express, which is just the acknowledgement that in your words, taking the time to mourn and finding the strength to fight are not incompatible. Um, talk through that a bit because so, so that is really the meta theme, if you will, of so many of these, these stories that you've, you've chosen to highlight for all of us is this ability that, no, we as individuals and as societies can do both. Mm. When, when writing this, I was trying to fight against the injunction of urgency. Mm -hmm. When thinking of these issues, we're always overwhelmed by the urgency. There's always, right. you always hear, oh, we have three years before the window mm -hmm. closes. 
uh, I think it's important to take a step back, realize that so many windows have already closed. When it comes to Pacific apocalypse, some of these windows closed 500 years ago, half a millennia ago. Um, and this constant race speeding forward is what led us into this crisis in the first place. It's important to step back, to put things in perspective, uh, if only in order to avoid advocating for superficial solutions, because there are ideological roots to all of these important problems, to the epidemiological apocalypse, to the nuclear apocalypse, to the climate apocalypse. Some of these problems have to do with racism, with systemic racism that have always put specific communities uh, at the forefront that those specific communities have always borne the brunt of this constant speed race towards modernity. So in order to uh, avoid advocating for superficial solutions like techno-utopianism, uh, yes, mourning is important, taking the time to realize what has been lost um, and finding what has what can permit to keep moving, what can permit to go forward and emphasizing the constant throughout the apocalypse. And that's going to sound cheesy, but it's so true. The constant is love. There is a real disjuncture between nuclear colonizers or carbon addicts that just move away from wastelands or from waste oceans and think they can disentangle themselves from the places that sustain them think they can go to Mars on the one hand and the communities that continue to love the land even after it has been made irradiated, even after it has begun to go underwater. So really insisting on the historical continuities, the same roots to many of these issues and try to implement the same solutions that have worked in the past. So other than, you know, writing writing this book, The the Ocean on Fire, you you teach. And I'm curious because my limited knowledge of teaching literature in the United States is that you're going to read, um, as a typical student, you, you'll focus a lot on American literature such that it is. You'll focus on British classics just because that's part of the inherited institutional system. Um, and you'll probably be exposed to French, Russian, increasingly African and Middle Eastern voices, but that oceanic artists are probably, if not the most underrepresented, one of the most underrepresented classes of literature that even advanced students are exposed to. Um, how do you find that changes the way in which you try to incorporate this into your teaching on literature and and how is it received when you open people's eyes to this new world of expression? One of the great injustices about Pacific cultures is the outside of Oceania and even in many contemporary colonies in Oceania. They're taught in anthropology departments and to some extent in history departments, but mostly anthropology, archaeology, history, disciplines that deal with the past. These artworks are almost never discussed in literature departments, in philosophy departments, in uh, theater departments, uh, in music departments. So they're not considered as contemporary artworks. And this, again, talking about, you know, transgenerational issues, it's been 500 years that Pacific cultures have been declared by the West, doomed to disappear, relegated to the past. So this Relegation to the past has taken many forms. Some Pacific islands or islanders were described as stuck in the Stone Age, as primitive cannibals. Some were described as, in much more meliorative terms, as uh, noble savages. But either way, the cultures were seen as, if not at the beginning of history, outside of history altogether. So I think it's very important in academic disciplines to put an end to this ongoing discrimination of Pacific contemporary artistic and philosophical output and to stop treating it as relics of the past, but instead see it as right. the first or some of the first people in the world who are dealing with the most urgent problems, who are dealing with the issue of the Anthropocene, who are dealing with 
since the 15th century, the 16th century, seeing what it's like to have biopolitical change, man-made change, shatter your environment. This is a global crisis today, but it's been a Pacific crisis for 500 years. Absolutely. Well, we will close by reaching into our so-called chatterbox okay. to ask a uh, question that fate decides. Anais, who is someone in your field or a related one whose work more people should be following? That's a tough one because, as you said, Pacific studies are so marginalized that <laughs> there are too many people that everybody should read. Um, I want to share one of my personal favorite texts. Uh, it's Chantal Spitz's Insolent and Useless Thoughts, where she really tackles the secular issues that we've talked about and shares it in, in the most beautiful prose you can read. You cannot read this and not feel invigorated into joining the fight against nuclear colonialism and climate imperialism. Excellent. Thank you for highlighting that. Thank you. I really, I really want to thank you. I'm grateful to you for for your voice, uh, for what you've decided to put into print, which I know cannot be easy to characterize so many things and find your own words in which to express them, um, and for, for sharing your time with me to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter.